If you are someone who's been searching for the changes in the AAA paper all around the internet, then my dear friend, your search has come to an end because I'm Vishnu Vijay, a proud Fintrammer, and I welcome you all to this session where we are going to discuss about the changes in the Advanced Audit and Assurance paper, which takes effect from the September 2022 exam setting. And of course, before we deep dive in, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon so that you can get notified for more informative ACCA content. So let's get started, shall we? So what exactly has changed in the AAA paper from September 2022? Let's take a look at that. So folks, the first thing that we're going to take a look at is what has changed in the syllabus of AAA. Now, as you can see here, we have syllabus areas from A to I now, isn't it? It used to be till H, but now we have one more syllabus area added into it, which is professional skills. Now, don't get too much worried here because professional skill is not something or it's not an area where you learn something technical. Okay, folks, there's no technical knowledge here, but rather it's a skill that you need to develop when uh, you practice questions or when you present your answer to the examiner. That's basically all it is. Okay, folks. So let's take a look at the new syllabus one by one, shall we? So we're going to uh, start off with syllabus part A, that is regulatory environment. The folks, we're talking about the international regulatory environment for the audit profession, where we learn about the basic laws and regulations that regulate the audit profession. Okay, folks, we will learn all about these within our uh, video lectures as well, isn't it? So remember that. And then we have part B, where we le learn about the uh, professional as well as ethical consideration. Identifying professional issues or ethical issues from a scenario is a common question in the uh, AAA exam. Okay, folks, and this is exactly the area where we uh, learn the theoretical aspects in relation to it. And then we have syllabus part C, which is quality management. Now, this is a syllabus area that has changed a bit. Okay, folks, it's kind of a small, uh, you know, syllabus area compared to the others. But the only change is that we used to learn about quality control standards, which was ISC 220 and ISQZ1. Okay, folks, that's what we used to learn. However, in the new syllabus, we have a revised version of ISC 220, which we will take a look at shortly. And of course, we are also going to learn about some firm level quality control standards, which is known as ISQ M1 and ISQ M2 as well. Okay, folks, that's the primary change that has occurred within the syllabus. And of course, there is also some aspects in relation to sustainability as well. We will get into that. And in part D, we learn about the overall audit process, isn't it? From its planning stage. So we look at planning and conducting an audit of historical financial information. And after that, we look at part D, where we look at completion, review and reporting, where we learn about how the auditor provides their opinion, how is the audit report structured, isn't it? So that's basically what we learn here. And after that, we look at part F, that is other assignments. And what is other assignments all about? It's all about some other review engagements or agreed upon procedures that we conduct, isn't it? So that's basically all it is. Okay, folks, so we learn about a review of prospective financial information. We look at due diligence review, forensic audit, etc., isn't it? Now, more than about that, we also look at uh, how to audit KPIs or key performance indicators demonstrated by a particular audit client as well. Okay, folks, that's that's something that's newly covered as well. Well, there were a few things already existing in relation to sustainability, but nowadays we also audit. We also would have to take a look at the, uh, I would say, non-financial aspects of things as well. Okay, folks, such as uh, reviewing an integrated report, perhaps. Okay, folks, so that is something that's newly covered uh, within the syllabus as well. And of course, this is something that we look at through practicing questions primarily. Okay, folks, we have practiced a lot of questions regarding this within the uh, video question marathon. Okay, folks, so don't worry uh, about that. And then we move on to part G, which is current issues and developments, which is something that we always, you know, uh, keep up to date about, isn't it? We already saw, uh, covered some of the current issues within the video lectures itself. And of course, we will also be covering some new current issue which can come up uh, through various technical articles in various, uh, various live sessions, as well as through uh, more video lectures uh, as well. Okay, folks, we don't worry about that. And now we move on to the newly added syllabus area, that is part H, professional skills. 
So as we all know, for the optional papers of ACCA, the professional marks or the proportion of professional marks available have increased, isn't it? It used to be four marks out of uh, 100, isn't it? Now it's 20 marks uh, out of the one, 100 mark, which is allocated to professional marks. Okay, folks, so that's basically the pri uh, primary idea here. And of course, the professional skills are kind of similar to what you would have seen in the SBL exam as well, if you have attended that. But no worries, we will, of course, be taking a look at each of these skills one by one. And our primary objective here is to understand how these professional skills should be applied in the exam, isn't it? And that is something that we've covered through various, you know, question practice sessions within the video question marathon. And more and about that, the professional skills is all about how you present your answer to the examiner. Okay, folks, how is it structured? What kind of language should you use? Or what kind of points should you cover uh, when presenting your answer? That's basically as to what uh, professional skills are all about. It's a skill and there's nothing, you know, uh, theoretical to learn here. As simple as that. And moving on to part I, which is employability and technology skills, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, yet again another skill that you need to have. It's just the basic computer skills that you need to have in order to attend a CBE exam. That's basically all it is. And this is yet again, uh, you know, something that we provide our students with, isn't it? So we, we practice the uh, questions within the video question marathon in the CBE environment so that you can get a feeler as to how to use the tools and functionalities in the environment in a bit more efficient and effective manner. And of course, we also discuss about a lot of tips and tricks uh, to tackling these sort of questions as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what part I is all about. Now, this is basically the entire syllabus of Tripoli. Now, moving on to the next aspect, that is the exam. Okay, folks, so we looked at what, what has changed in the syllabus, isn't it? So the only change is in the uh, quality control related standards, as well as some aspects in relation to sustainability uh, information as well. So there could be a scenario in the uh, exam where you will have to identify issues when reviewing, let's say, a sustainability report or uh, an integrated report, and you may have to audit some of the KPIs. You may have to write substantive procedures or audit procedures on some of the KPIs. That's basically the uh, uh, new aspect when it comes to the syllabus. Now let's take a look at the new exam structure and understand what has changed here, shall we? So it's still a three hour and 15 minutes exam. And we have two sections yet again, section A and B. And in section A, we have a 50 mark question. And in section B, we have to 25 mark questions as well. Okay, so there's no change there, isn't it? However, when it comes to the mark allocation, there is a slight, you know, change from the, uh, I wouldn't say a slight, it's a drastic change from the, you know, uh, previous sessions as well. So in section A, out of the 50 mark, or, or in the 50 mark question, 40 marks are basically the technical marks. Okay, folks, the mark uh, for which you provide, you know, relevant points, that's basically all it is. And for the rest of the 10 marks, these would be professional marks now. Okay, folks, that's the change here. It used to be uh, 46 technical marks and four professional marks, but now it has changed to 40 technical marks and 10 professional marks. Okay, folks, and yet again, uh, I'd like to point out something here. How do you gain the professional marks? It's not something that you gain by writing something extra. Okay, folks, let me tell you that. It's all about structuring your answer in a professional manner. That's basically it. And we will get into detail about that. Uh, and yeah, there's nothing, uh, just to clarify this yet again, there's nothing, there's no need to write something extra, you know, to gain these professional marks. It's all about the uh, method in which you present your answer in and the uh, kind of language that you use to present your answer and the points uh, or the structure uh, that your answer would be presented as well. Okay, folks, remember that. Moving on to section B, we have two 25 mark questions, isn't it? Now, for each of the 25 mark questions, 20 marks are technical marks that you score, whereas the rest of the five marks will be professional marks. So, now it makes sense, isn't it? So, for each of the 25 mark questions, we have five professional marks each, isn't it? That gives us a total of 10 professional marks in section B. 
and therefore a grand total of 20 professional marks are available in both these sections okay folks so keep this in mind and as i st stated earlier i'm saying it again there is no need to write something extra for this professional marks it's all about how you structure your answer okay folks remember that now that's basically all about the exam structure for your triple exam now moving on to the next aspect that is time allocation so what can change when it comes to the time allocation? The only change is in the reading and planning phase, I would say. Okay, folks, so I'm going to allocate some more time to think about a structure for my answer so that I can get those professional marks. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, idea here. Now, as always, for each of the questions, I'll be allocating time to re reading and planning as well as for writing my answer. And what do we do in reading and planning exactly? We read the requirement, the scenario, highlight the relevant information that we require for our answer, and then plan a structure for our answer, isn't it? So I could take another maybe three to four or even five minutes to think of a structure for my answer, and it should be utilized effectively. And with practice, that can, you know, you can get the hang of it. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. So I could take around maybe uh, for the 50 mark question, especially, I could take around 20 to 25 minutes in order to read and plan the particular answer. And secondly, I'll take an hour and five minutes to write my answer. Okay, folks, that's basically the first allocation. 25 minutes for reading and planning and an hour and five minutes for writing my answer. This is for our 50 mark question. Now, when it comes to the 25 mark question, I would take eight minutes for one 25 mark question for reading and planning one 25 mark question. And of course, 37 minutes to write it down. Okay, folks. So what's the idea here? I'm just allocating some extra time to reading and to reading and planning so that you can plan a structure for your answer. That's basically all it is. And this is basically to get those professional marks. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea. And of course, the time taken for reading and planning could be different for different students because some people are more like quick readers. And of course, uh, some people can plan the structure in a bit more quicker manner. So they may take, take less time, which is great, isn't it? So uh, for those who are people who are a bit more slow, I would say just practice more question or in other words, practice more time questions so that you can become compatible with the time strategy. Okay, folks, so remember that. So that's basically all about time allocation. So we looked at the changes within the syllabus, we looked at changes in the exam structure, and I also suggested a time allocation strategy as well, isn't it? So now we move on to something that you've all been waiting for, that is the professional skills. So let's take a look at each of these professional skills, shall we? The first skill that we're going to take a look at is basically the communication skill. So what exactly is the idea here or how do we score the marks available for communication skill? Well, all you have to do is you just have to provide a clear and convincing explanation. That's the first thing that you have to do here. Okay, folks, whatever you're writing as your answer, it should be clear and it should convey what you're intending to convey. That's basically the first point. And secondly, you must respond in a professional manner to the instructions provided in the requirement. When it comes to a AAA question or a typical, let's say, 50 mark key study question, the requirement would be a reply or it, it would be to prepare briefing notes for, let's say, the audit partner or audit manager based on the instructions that they provided, isn't it? So when you're providing such a reply, how should your reply be? Should there be any format to it? Should there be any structure or language to it? That is how you score marks here, okay, folks? So just structure your answer in a professional manner or write your language that you use while writing your answer should be in a professional manner. That's all it is. And of course, I will, of course, be demonstrating how you score these, uh, you know, particular marks in the video question marathon when we practice a lot of questions, especially in the CBE environment as well. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. And of course, there are a lot of, you know, tips and tricks that you can use, uh, especially when it comes to communication skills as well. Now. Moving on to commercial acumen skill. Okay, folks, that's another really important skill that could be tested in the exam. And uh, this could especially be tested if your, uh, let's say, instructions or requirement requires you to point out or identify business risks from a particular scenario. Okay, folks. And uh, so what do you have to do in order to score these? 
uh, commercial marks, professional marks for commercial skills. Let's take a look. First of all, you have to demonstrate awareness and show insights. Now, what does this mean? You have to understand the particular client given in the scenario based on the information provided. And of course, you have to understand where this organization is going to or uh, is there any sort of going concern issue or is there anything in its environment that can affect the business? Okay, folks, this is how you show insight. Okay, folks, just understand the organization and uh, try to identify any sort of key issues and use judgment in order to uh, recommend things. Okay, folks, so this could go wrong for the audit client or this is a really big risk that the audit client is fa facing. So understand that, okay, folks, or identify that from the scenario information give, uh, given. Okay, folks, that's basically how you demonstrate commercial acumen. It's all about commercial thinking and, uh, you know, how, how you can maximize profitability for, for the organization that you're auditing, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically the uh, idea here. Hey, sorry to interrupt you here, but I just want to give you an update that Fintram Global has updated all their sessions for the optional papers as per the latest amendments which takes effect from the September 2022 exam setting. So if you are a student who is looking to attend these sessions for your upcoming exam, then feel free to log on to Fintram.com or call us on the number given below. And if you have any sort of questions, then feel free to shoot them in the comment section as well. So glad I could inform you about this. Now let's continue with the session. Now, moving on to another professional skill that is professional skepticism and judgment. Now this is a really important skill uh, that you need to demonstrate when it comes to the AAA exam because professional skepticism is something that every auditor uh, should have, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here, okay folks? So especially when you are uh, faced with scenario information, especially in relation to let's say an extract of financial statements or any sort of information provided by the client do you like like blindly believe everything uh, that is given to you when you're auditing no not really isn't it so you should have that questioning mindset okay folks you should challenge some of the information given in the scenario okay folks so the first and foremost thing to do is to explore the scenario Read through it and understand what the overall uh, situation is. Get the bigger picture there, okay, folks? And secondly, you try to challenge some of the information. If management has provided some sort of evidence, is that reliable? Or uh, if the management has done sort of, some sort of accounting treatment, is that appropriate or is that correct? This is how you challenge the information, okay, folks? And finally, you exercise judgment. Exercising judgment is basically uh, something that you demonstrate either in the case study questions or several other questions as well. It's all about, uh, you know, providing valuable recommendations or providing valuable uh, insights for certain situations. And uh, I'll give you an example here. When it comes to the 50 mark question, you will most definitely be required to point out or identify audit risks or risk of material misstatement from a particular scenario. Okay, folks so in such a situation for the new uh, set of exams you will have to prioritize the most significant audit risk to the less significant audit risk okay, folks so in your answer or in the answer that you're providing to the examiner you will have to identify the risk first of all and then prioritize the risk in such a way that the most significant risk should come first and the less significant uh, you know should come next okay folks that's basically how you should uh, prioritize things and this is something that you can use or this is something that you need to do using your own professional judgment okay folks so that's basically the idea here so that's basically as to what professional skepticism and judgment is all about now moving on to analysis and evaluation now what's the idea here well, it's all about considering all the information provided and of course, conducting a careful assessment of the scenario based on the information that's provided. Okay, folks. And yeah, this is kind of a, co a common thing that we do in our previous exams as well. But uh, yeah, it's all about analyzing the information such as extracts of, let's say, uh, financial statements or uh, it, it could be an extract of auditor support, etc. Just, just analyze the or consider all the information that is provided to you and then you should con con uh, conduct a careful assessment and what does assessment mean here 
Assessment means all the positives as well as negatives. Okay, folks, so that you will have to have a have a big bigger picture as to what's going on within the scenario. Of course, you can, you will only be able to understand uh, you know how these skills should be demonstrated when practicing questions, and that is exactly that what we will be doing in the video question marathon. Okay, folks, we will be practicing a lot of questions uh, regarding these professional skills, especially in the CBE environment. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. Now, so yeah, that's all for the professional skill aspect. Now let's move on to some of the newly introduced topics to the syllabus, shall we? So as I mentioned earlier, there are a few new standards on quality control and the existing quality control standard that is IAC 220 has been revised as well. So what exactly is the new standard? What has changed? Let's take a look at uh, those, shall we? So folks, when we talk about quality control, there are three standards. That should come to our mind okay folks one two and three the first standard is the iac 220 of course to be more specific the revised version of iac 220 which focuses on individual level of quality control and then we have the new standard isqm1 which focuses on quality control at a firm level. And then there is ISQM2, which focuses on quality control review. Okay, folks, EQR, or in other words, engagement quality control review. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So these are the three standards that we primarily focus on when we talk about quality control. And as we all know, Quality is a really important factor when it comes to audit, isn't it? So why exactly is that? Because if we do not conduct a good quality audit, then can the public or the investors or all other stakeholders rely on our opinion? No, not really, isn't it? Because our opinion may not be accurate at all, which is exactly why conducting a quality audit is really mandatory. Okay, folks, and we follow these set of standards to conduct such a quality audit as well. So, what all things can we ensure at an individual level as well as a firm level you know, to ensure that our audits are conducted at the most uh, high quality? Let's take a look at that, shall we? So, I'm just going to read out the names of each of these standards one by one. The first standard was ISA220, revised version, of course. And uh, the name of the standard is Quality Management for an audit of financial statements okay folks so that's basically it and we look this particular standard is on an individual level what should each and every individual or each and every audit personnel within an organization or within an audit firm do in order to ensure quality that's what we're going to look at in this particular standard and secondly we have isqm1 which is quality management for firms that perform audits or reviews of financial statements or other assurance or related uh, service engagement. So this particular standard focuses on not just the audit process, but also the review engagements and other assurance processes as well. And this particular standard is uh, more from a firm level perspective. What should the audit firm do, not an individual, but what should the audit firm do to ensure quality in their audits? There are some common principles in each of these things or in each of these standards. Okay, folks, we will discuss, th discuss that particular aspect shortly. And the third standard is basically ISQM2, which is engagement quality reviews. Okay, folks, so a particular audit team may have conducted the audit process and they may have provided an opinion. So an other audit team is gonna review the work of this particular audit team. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what EQR is all about. That's basically all there. Now, uh, we will look into it in a bit more detail. Now, let's take a look at each of the elements of quality control management systems. Now, when we talk about quality control management systems, what all things should we focus on? Or in each of these three standards that we just discussed, what are the, what are the primary things that we should focus on? Let's talk about that, shall we? So, there are eight things that you have to or eight elements for conducting a good quality audit or eight elements that we should focus on in order to conduct a good quality audit the first element is known as leadership responsibilities okay, folks so 
we will get into each of these one by one. And secondly, we look at ethical requirements. Are we complying with the code of ethics or not? Then there is acceptance and continuance. There are some procedures that we conduct when we accept an audit engagement, isn't it? Which is something that we looked at in IAC 210 throughout the video lectures as well, isn't it? The preconditions of the audit, etc. So all these things are considered here. And then we look at the engagement resource. Do we have the appropriate level of resource to conduct a good quality audit? And then we look at engagement performance. We look at you know, direction, supervision, etc. And of course, we look at monitor, monitoring and remediation as well. That's another area that we focus on. We look at overall responsibility. Who, who is the individual who has the overall responsibility when conducting this engagement? Well, each and every team member does have uh, a commitment to conduct high quality uh, you know, audits. However, the primary responsibility lies with the leader of the audit team, which is basically the audit engagement partner. Okay, folks, remember that. And finally, there is documentation aspects as well. Okay, folks, we document everything as auditors. And so there are some quality uh, management systems in relation to, or there are some aspects that we should focus on documentation as well, which we will look at shortly. Okay, folks. So for the next few minutes, we will be deep diving into each of these elements one by one. And when we deep dive into each of these elements, you can, uh, you know, see that there are references made to the respective uh, quality control standards. It could be IS, ISA 220, IS, ISQM1 or ISQM2. And now we know as to what each of these standards are and, uh, you know, uh, what perspective should we see each of these standards as well, isn't it? So whenever there is a content which is referenced to ISA 220, you should think of that from an individual level. Whereas where, whenever you see a content which is referenced to ISQM1, you have to think it, think of it from a firm level, audit firm level perspective. Okay, folks, remember one. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, the first element that is leadership responsibilities. Now, let's understand one thing here. Who is the leader of an audit team? As I mentioned earlier, it is the engagement partner, isn't it? Or in other words, the audit partner. So let's read about that, shall we? The engagement partner takes overall responsibility for managing and achieving quality of the engagement. Okay, so the overall responsibility does die, lie with the uh, engagement partner. However, what does the engagement partner do exactly? Well, one of the primary, I would say, responsibilities of this particular personnel is to review, conduct reviews of work done by the audit manager as well as his team, isn't it? So they're only reviewing things. However, can we ensure quality in that manner? Or if only one individual within the audit team has a mindset of conducting a quality engagement, will that work? No, not really, isn't it? Each and every team member should have that uh, particular mindset, isn't it? So that's basically the idea that has been uh, emphasized here, okay, folks? So this requires a clear commitment to quality, emphasizing the following things. Emphasizing that all team members are responsible for contributing to the quality, be it the audit manager, be it the audit seniors, the audit juniors, etc. Everyone should have a commitment to the quality or they should contribute to the quality of the audit as well. <clears throat> what else? The importance of professional ethics, values and attitude. That's yet again another aspect that we look at as well, isn't it? So uh, we should, as auditors, we should comply with certain ethical principles as well. Are we complying to that? This is something that the audit engagement partner should ensure as part of their responsibility. And what else? The importance of open and robust communication within the team and the ability of the team to raise concerns without fear of repressal. So what's the idea here? So the idea here is that if let's say an audit junior or an audit senior has pointed out an issue is there an open communication platform to discuss that issue? Okay, folks. So by issue, what I mean is that if let's say that the auditors have identified, let's say a fraudulent activity or any sort of uh, other risky aspects within the audit client, then do they have a platform to discuss or to raise this issue to the audit manager or the audit partner? That's basically what we're ensuring here. Okay, folks. So one of the responsibilities of audit partners is to make sure that they have an open communication platform to raise concerns if they have if the audit team members have identified anything. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And another point is the importance of each team member exercising professional skepticism throughout the engagement. 
each and every OD team member should have a skeptical mindset. Okay, folks, that's basically all as to what, it, what this particular point means. And the audit engagement partner should in, uh, ensure this is happening as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what the uh, leadership responsibilities are all about. And of course, this is basically taken from IAC 220, the revised version. Okay, folks, so remember that. <clears throat> So we have to think of these things from an individual perspective. What should the engagement partner do? That's basically what uh, these sets of points are. Now, moving on to another element, and this is kind of an easy one as well, which is basically ethical requirements. Okay, folks. So yet again, we are taking these concepts from ISA 220 itself. And uh, it basically means that each and every individual within the audit firm must comply with the ACC's code of conduct as well as various other ethical standards issued by perhaps IESB as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So the engagement partner must identify. So yet again, it's a responsibility of the engagement partner as we discussed earlier as well, isn't it? So the engagement partner must identify, evaluate and address ethical threats. What are the ethical threats? It could be self-interest threat, self-review threat, advocacy threat or intimidation threat, isn't it? Or even familiarity threat as well, isn't it? So we need to make sure the audit partner, which is basically the leader of the audit team, should ensure that these threats are identified these are evaluated and these are addressed appropriately as well. Okay, folks, what else? The audit uh, partner <clears throat> must remain alert throughout the audit for breaches of ethical requirements. Kind of similar to what we looked at earlier as well. Is there any or is any of the audit team member breaching any sort of or uh, not complying with any of the ethical standards? That's basically what we have to ensure. Uh, they have to just, you know, keep, a, keep an eye out if that's happening or not, that's basically all that is. And what else? They must take appropriate action where ethical requirements have not been fulfilled. If there is any sort of non-compliance, that should be uh, you know, addressed as quickly as possible. Okay, folks, and what else? Prior to dating the auditor's report, take responsibility for determining whether ethical requirements have been fulfilled. So before signing the audit report, have we complied with all the ethical standards and requirements? If not, is there any non-compliance? If there is any non-compliance, uh, how have we addressed it? Okay, folks, that's basically all the things that we need to look at here. This is a simple principle, uh, or to put it very simply, to put all these points in, into a very simple point, it's just that you have to make sure that the ethical principles are complied with. Okay, folks, or the audit engagement partner must ensure that all these uh, principles are complied with, as simple as that. <clears throat> conducting audit ethically. That's basically all it is. Moving on, yet again, this is taken from IAC 220, the revised version. Moving on to the next aspect that is acceptance and continuance, which is an other element of quality control. So what are we discussing here? Let's take a look. So when it comes to acceptance and continuance, as I stated earlier, we're going to take a look at the principles that are set out in ISA 210, the preconditions of audit, and of course, uh, the relevant aspects that we should consider before accepting an engagement as well, that's there. However, there are some additional factors as, as per ISA 220 as well. Let's take a look. ISA 220, revised version, requires the engagement partner. It again, we're focusing it on an individual perspective since it's ISA 220, isn't it? So remember that. So it requires engagement partner to consider the following when con determining whether to accept or continue with client relationship. So what are we do looking at here? We're looking at not, not only the, uh, you know, acceptance part, but also the continuance part. Should we continue the relationship with the client or, or, or an audit with the client? That's basically another factor that we consider here as well. So what all factors are considered? Let's take a look. The first aspect is integrity and ethical values of principal owners, management, and those charged with governance. Okay, so who are these personals from? From the client. Okay, folks, remember that. So the engagement partner, yet again, must ensure that the owners of the organization or the owners of the audit client, as well as the management, as well as those charged with governance, which are basically the key executives, are they complying with all the ethical or do they have enough ethical values in their organization policies or company policies, etc.? And are they acting with integrity? That's basically something that we have to ensure here. And what else? whether sufficient and appropriate resources are available to perform the engagement. Okay, folks, that's yet again another aspect, isn't it? Does the audit firm 
So the engagement partner is ensuring that the audit firm, yet again, has the sufficient level of resources. And of course, are our resources compatible with that of the audit client as well? Okay, folks, so can we obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence? Why is this a primary focus here? Because if we cannot obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence, then we cannot provide an, an appropriate or an accurate opinion on the financial statements, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Now, what else? Whether management and those charged with governance have acknowledged their responsibilities in relation to the engagement. Well, this is as uh, this is something that we do as part of uh, you know the preconditions of an audit, isn't it? We obtain an acknowledgement from the management, agreeing a few things, isn't it? So that's basically what has been mentioned here. And what else? Whether the engagement team has the competence and capabilities, including sufficient time to perform the engagement. So yet again, this relates to the resource aspects, but also on the qualification of the resources that we have, primarily the you know uh, human resources that we have. Are they competent enough? Are they qualified? Do they have the sufficient level of time to conduct the audit? This is yet again something that we have to look at as well. With the significant matters that have arisen during the current or previous engagement have implications for continuing the engagement. So we may have conducted the audit for the current year or for the previous year for that matter. And were there any sort of like risky areas that have arisen or risky matters that have arisen, which points out that it's not good if we continue our client relationship with this particular audit client. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So were there any sort of significant matters which may be of concern? If not, then we can definitely continue our engagement. However, if there is any sort of you know matters, then definitely we may have to withdraw from the engagement, isn't it? For, for example, if the, uh, let's say, the audit client is involved in something illegal or uh, if, if, they, if they're not complying with the local accounting standards or uh, there's a there's a high level of, let's say, window dressing within the financial statement. If there is such serious issues, then definitely we may, uh, there's no point in continuing the uh, relationship with the client. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And it could even be, you know, small set, uh, a bit more serious issue, like uh, there could be going concern issues within the client or something like that. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So significant matters can be any such thing. Now, so all these things are considered when we decide whether or not to accept that particular engagement or if we are planning to continue with that engagement or not. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Moving on to the next element, that is engagement resources. Now, when we talk about engagement resources here, we're considering three resources primarily. There is the human resource, which is basically the audit staff itself. And it's not just the audit staff, I would say it's also the uh, let's say internal audit team from the audit client if we are using their assistance or it could be some IT personnel if we are conducting audit on certain systems and processes etc isn't it so that's basically the idea here and then there are also technic technological resources as well do we have do we have the appropriate level of audit software you know to conduct the audit and is it is it compatible with the audit clients systems and softwares that's basically something that we have to look at as well because in the modern era we're also conducting digital audits as well isn't it so that's basically uh, why uh, this particular aspect has been included within the standard as well if folks remember that this is a new addition and of course we also look at intellectual resources as well okay folks so these are the three primary resources that we have to ensure to make sure that we can conduct a good quality audit for our client. I can see that you're enjoying the video here. Sorry to interrupt you here, but just want to remind you that FinTram provides end-to-end -end support from registration to coaching and mentoring. And we also provide assistance in the job-related queries that some students have as well. Now, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon for more informative content as well. Now, let's continue with the session, shall we? So let's take a look at each of these one by one, shall we? So first of all, let's talk about human resources. The engagement team, auditors, external experts, and internal auditors who provide direct assistance must be competent and capable to perform the audit as per IAC 220. Yet again, we're looking at from an individual perspective. So each and every individual within the audit team it's not just the audit team or not just the engagement team, in other words, but it's also the experts that we use to conduct the audit. 
It works for valuation purposes or various other purposes. Uh, and it can also be the internal audit team which we, uh, who, whose help we use as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. So are these people capable and uh, do they have the sufficient level of competence or not? Okay, folks, so what is this competence and capability all about? Or what are the specific factors that we're looking for to identify as to whether the individual is competent or capable? Let's talk about that, shall we? Competence and capabilities includes the consideration of the following things. The first thing is practical experience. Are they experienced enough? For example, if we are auditing, let's say, a listed audit client or a large or complex client, then we need to have audit staff with the sufficient level of qualification and experience, isn't it? So that's basically what we're looking at here. And secondly, understanding of professional standards. So does our audit team member have an understanding of all the professional standards which is required to conduct the audit? And do they have any knowledge of the, perhaps the accounting or accounting or local accounting standards for the client that we're auditing, etc. All these things come under here. And it also uh, has the ethical standards as well. Okay, folks, so whatever professional standards there are, as simple as that. Expertise in specialized area of accounting and auditing. Do they have that speciality? Do they have that knowledge speci uh, specifically? And then what else? Expertise in IT or automated tools and techniques. If we are using some sort of audit software or a new, uh, let's say, technological aspects for conducting the audit, for example, for selecting samples, etc., there could be a particular software to choose like random selections, etc. So if, if there are some, you know, technological aspects introduced or uh, technological tools and techniques, automated techniques that we use, then are our audit team members knowledgeable in these things? That's basically something that we make sure as well. And what else? Knowledge of relevant industries. So do they have the knowledge of the industry in which the audit client operates in? That's something that we look at and the ability to exercise professional skepticism and judgment this is a really crucial when it comes to auditors isn't it so that's basically something that we look at as well and finally understanding of the firm's policies and procedures will these audit team members comply with the firm's policies and procedures and we may have some the audit firm would have some sort of you know policies and procedures uh, with the use of experts or with the use of internal auditors as well so uh, will they be able to comply with these? That's what we're looking at over here. Okay, folks, yet again, we're looking at it from an individual's level. Okay, folks, not, not an audit firm level, so keep this in mind. Now, <clears throat> moving on to the next aspect. So what would happen if there are insufficient resources? Then what, what should be the action? That's something that the standard also states, states as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look. If insufficient resources are made available, the following actions can be taken. Okay, what all things are there? First of all, change the planned audit approach. So we will have to revise the approach to auditing the particular client. Okay, folks, if there if we don't have, let's say, sufficient level of staff, then there could be an increase in timeline for conducting the audit, isn't it? That's possible. And what else? Arrange an extension to the reporting deadline, as I mentioned earlier. Follow the firm's policies and procedures for revolve resolving differences of opinion so if there is any sort of differences in opinion within the team member regarding certain let's say matters that may have arised when conducting the audit then this should be resolved as per the firm's policies or, or procedures that they have in place and what else withdraw from the engagement if possible under applicable law or regulation now this is like a last resort Okay, folks, so if you're recommending such approaches in a particular answer within the AAA exam, or if you're recommending that we should withdraw from the engagement, then you have to make sure that this is a last resort. Okay, folks, this is the only, uh, only option that we have. Okay, folks, because when it comes to terminating a contract with a particular audit client, that's like, you know, losing out on business, isn't it? So we have to make sure that we have tried everything before coming to the conclusion of withdrawing from an audit. Okay, folks, so that's basically a really important thing to keep in mind here. Now, uh, so that's all for the human resource aspect of it. Now moving on to the technological resources. Let's take a look at that. Technological resources include technology to conduct meetings, communication and automated tools and techniques. The auditor must be careful not to place too much reliance on those resources. 
So folks, even though technology has made things a bit more easier, for example, introduction, introduction of audit softwares and uh, which is, let's say, uh, softwares for selecting samples, etc., or for testing certain journal entries, etc. If, if these sorts of softwares uh, can test more than, uh, you know, what we usually would have tested if there were no software, then effectively, it's making our lives easier, isn't it? So we could test close to like 100% of our population these days using these tools and techniques. However, the problem is that we should not rely too much on them. Okay, folks, too much reliance on these things can be a bit problematic. And this is something that's being reflected in the revised uh, code of ethics as well, or revised code for auditors as well. Okay, folks, this is something that we uh, discussed during the current issue session through our video lectures as well, isn't it? So too much reliance on these sort of resources, or these sort of technological resources can be, can like Im impair our judgment. Okay, folks, so that's basically a problem. Now, moving on. So technological resources, what exactly are these? These are basically the audit softwares and tools and techniques, yes. However, more and above that, it's also the resources, uh, or to provide a bit more sensible definition, I would say, it includes the technology to conduct meetings, communication, and automated tools and techniques. Okay, folks, so not just the audit softwares, but also several other softwares, such as, let's say, Microsoft Teams, or uh, let's say, Zoom, to conduct meetings, etc. Okay, folks, all these things come under technological resources. For example, for the within the, you know, let's say recent pandemic that we had, uh, everyone was working from home, isn't it? So during that particular time, we need to, we, we should have had the sufficient level of softwares like Microsoft Teams to conduct meetings as well as to like share information between teams, etc. Isn't it? So that's basically the set of resources that they're talking about here. What else? Moving on to the next aspect, we have intellectual resources. Now, what are these? Intellectual resources are basically things like the audit methodologies. Okay, folks, so yeah, let's read about it. Intellectual resources include audit methodologies, implementation tools, audit guides, templates, and checklists. Now, these are items that are specific to each audit firms. Each audit firms will have their own methodologies for conducting the audit, and these methodologies will be in line with the uh, you know, uh, relevant standards that we have for the particular jurisdiction. Okay, folks, it could be the international standards itself, as well as some local auditing standards as well. Okay, folks, it depends upon what client we are auditing and where we are, you know, conducting our practice as well. Okay, folks, remember that. And of course, templates and checklists, well, these are, there are basically some, you know, uh, report templates as well as previous forms that we fill out to uh, as part of creating our work papers and that is exactly what we're talking about here okay folks and yet again these templates are also created based on the uh, relevant jurisdiction and the type of audit client that we're auditing as well okay folks remember that <clears throat> and uh, what else these allow for consistent application and understanding of professional standards so it's basically it okay folks it's kind of uh, like specific to each of the audit firms. These sort of intellectual resources are specific to each audit firms and they prepare these sort of templates, checklists or various other, uh, let's say resources based on the professional standards. It could be the international as well as the local standards. And of course, it all varies depending upon, there, there would be some specific standards uh, specific to certain audit clients as well. Okay, folks, there could be, and there are a different set of clients uh, uh, within the industries, and there could be uh, large scale organizations, small scale organizations, there could be uh, complex organizations as well as simple organizations as well, profitable, I mean, profit focused organizations or not for profit organizations as well, isn't it? So, for each of these organizations, there would be some sort of like uh, a standardized set of work papers that we use in order to conduct the audit. Okay, folks, so that's basically what we're talking about here. And it's not just the these templates and checklists, but also the methodology of conducting the audit as well, as well as certain other implementation tools as well. Okay, folks, so that, that's basically all of this. So that's basically as to what are the resources that we're focusing on, engagement resources element. Okay, folks, remember that. Now, moving on to the next element that is engagement performance. So when it comes to engagement performance, we're looking at four aspects here. We look at the direction, supervision, review, and EQR, or in other words, engagement quality review. Okay, folks. 
So basically, it's a mix. I, I would say it's a mix of all three standards. Okay, well, in this particular uh, element, we're going to be looking at contents, or we we're going to be looking at points, which are a mix of all three standards. That is ISC two twenty, ISQM one, as well as ISQM uh, two as well. So let's take a look at each of these, shall we? So when it comes to engagement performance, the first aspect that we're going to focus on is direction. Okay, folks, how are we directing the audit? Let's take a look at that. Yet again, we are conducting this or we're looking at it from an individual perspective, first of all. Uh, so direction involves informing team members of their responsibility to contribute to the management and achievement of quality of the engagement, maintain a questioning mind and exercise professional skepticism, and then fulfill ethical requirements. Well, let's take a look at each, uh, three of these, one, uh, first of all, shall we? The first aspect <clears throat> is that we need to provide a direction to the team members to ensure that they're conducting the audit quality with the appropriate level of quality. And secondly, we need to ensure that these team members are maintaining a questioning mindset throughout the audit. Are they challenging what needs to be challenged? That's basically what we are ensuring here. And the third aspect is, uh, are all the audit team members complying with the ethical requirements? As simple as that. What else? And of course, uh, the leader here, who's the leader here, audit engagement partner, should en ensure that the team members are performing audit procedures and for experienced team members to direct, supervise and review the work of less experienced team members. That's yet again a, a common practice in the audit industry, isn't it? So the more experienced people will review the work of the less experienced people, isn't it? That's basically it. And of course, the review is something that's really uh, a, a common thing when it comes to conducting an audit. Okay, folks, so the audit senior will review the audit junior's work and the audit manager will review the audit senior's work and uh, there could be senior managers as well as audit partners and these people will review what the managers and seniors have done. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And the overall audit team's review or the work conducted by the overall audit team is reviewed by the EQR. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, how the flow works here. What else? Understand the objective of the work to be performed. Does everyone in our audit team understand what they're doing? Because if they're not, then effectively there could be a lack of quality, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. So uh, each and every member should understand the level of what as to what they're doing. And of course, uh, this is just to ensure that, uh, you know, this, these individuals know as to whether they are doing the sufficient and appropriate level of work. Because if they're not, then effectively the conclusions reached could be wrong, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And what else? Address threats to the achievement of quality, for example, budget or resource constraint, should not result in team members failing to perform the planned audit procedures. <clears throat> so if there are any sort of threats, to the achievement of quality. What could these threats be? An example is provided here. The budget or resource constraints. Okay, folks. So the budgeted hours for a particular audit could be lesser than what is actually needed. If that's that if that if that happens, then that's effectively a lack of quality or a quality issue, isn't it? So we should make sure that everything is planned appropriately and we are allotting sufficient time for the audit. And we should also make sure that we have the sufficient level of resources to conduct the audit as well. Do we have the appropriate set of uh, audit juniors to work on certain things? Do we have experience level of audit seniors or managers for the team? All these things should be made sure of. Okay, folks. So if there are any sort of threats that's happening, then we need to make sure that these are addressed as well. As simple as that. Okay, folks. That's basically all about uh, direction. Now let's take a look at supervision. So supervision is yet, yet again something that we look at from an individual perspective, isn't it? So let's take a look at each of the points. What is supervision exactly? It's basically observing the work of others or supervising the work of others, as simple as that. So tracking the progress of the audit to ensure that, ensure the objective of the work is achieved and adequate ongoing resources are assigned. Yet again, this is kind of similar to direction itself. Direction sets the objective and guides the team members to achieve that objective. That's basically as to what direction is. But supervision is supervising the work done by the team members, as simple as that. Okay, folks. So we look at as to 
whether the objective or uh, are we progressing towards the objective of the audit appropriately? Are there any sort of like, uh, you know, any, any sort of event that may cause us to provide an opinion which lacks quality. That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. And uh, yeah, it, it's also ensuring as to whether we have the adequate level of resources as well. So after reading through some of these points, we could understand that there are some similar points in each of the elements, isn't it? So the key thing is to understand the headings of the elements itself. Okay, folks, by understanding each of these elements, you will be able to uh, understand what are the things that we need to look for to improve quality. Okay, folks, as simple as that. Now, let's move, move on. Addressing issues arising and modifying the planned approach accordingly. For example, by reassigning planned procedures to more experienced team members when issues are more complex, are more complex than initially anticipated. So when it comes to the audit process, at the planning stage, what do we do? At the planning stage, we set a materiality level and we could expect a few, let's say, risky areas, isn't it? So we could see that the area in relation to debt could be a bit risky or the area in relation to inventory valuation could be a risk, bit risky for the audit client. We could anticipate a few things. However, as we progress on with the audit, there could be more issues that may, we may have identified. If, if such thing happens, then what would happen? Then there is a need for revising our original plan, isn't it? So that's basically what we're talking about here. Okay, folks, if there is any sort of issues that have arisen while progressing through the audit, then what we're going to do is we're going to re-revise our plan and we provide some work to more experienced audit team members. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. What else? Identifying matters for consultation where the firm lacks appropriate internal expertise. So if there is any sort of thing where the audit team members are not familiar of or, or they need guidance on how to approach this, then what they can do is they can consult with others. Okay, folks. So the idea uh, or the process goes like this. A process of consultation goes like this. Consultation. There we go. Looks like a heartbeat, but you get the point. Now, uh, the first and foremost thing that you have to understand is that if there is any sort of issue that arises when conducting an audit, there would be a team meeting of the audit team members. Okay, folks, I'm just gonna rewrite this. There we go. So the first and foremost thing to do is to consult the issue within the audit team itself. Okay, folks, so the audit team can consist of you know, the audit managers, audit partners, and more experienced people, isn't it? So the first and foremost, thing, if, if we have identified an issue, then it will be discussed among the audit team members. Now, if this is not possible, then what we can do is, we can consult with another audit team within the audit firm. Okay, folks, what are we going to do? We're going to consult with an audit team within the audit firm. Okay, folks, that's basically what we're going to do here. And of course, this particular audit team members will be more experienced in such areas, could be. And if it's still, the, if, if the issue is still not resolved, then what do we do? Then what we can do is we can ask for external consultation as well. Okay, folks, we can consult with an external firm for a solution. But if you are like consulting with an external, uh, let's say firm or an organization for the solution, then definitely these things will be documented by us as well. Okay, folks, so remember that. So that's basically how the consultation process works. First of all, the issue is discussed within the audit team. If not, then it goes outside the audit team, but within the firm itself. If if that's not possible, or if, if we are st we still have that issue, or if, if the issue is still not resolved, then yet again, we go to an external organization for uh, resolving this issue. Okay, folks, and if that happens, then this particular, uh, you know, uh, the process that has happened with, with the particular external organization will be documented appropriately as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically how the consultation aspect works. Moving on, providing coaching to help develop skills and competencies. So what's the idea here? 
Supervision also involves coaching the less, less experienced audit team members. That's basically what it is. And what else? Creating an environment where engagement team members can raise concern without fear of repressal. We, we looked at a similar point uh, earlier as well, especially, uh, yeah, when we looked at the element of leadership responsibilities as well, isn't it? So there should be an open communication platform for the audit team members to communicate or to raise any sort of concern that they have identified while conducting the audit. Okay, folks, and it should be addressed as soon as possible as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea provided here. So that's basically all about supervision. It's kind of some like general guidelines. That's basically all it is. And moving on to the next aspect that is review. When we talk about the review aspect of engagement performance, what exactly are we talking about here? We're talking about the review of the work conducted by the audit team members. Have they complied with the appropriate professional standards? Have they complied with the, uh, let's say, policies and procedures that the audit firm have in place, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Let's take a look at some more things as well. Review responsibilities include consideration of whether the work has been performed in accordance with professional standards, policies, and procedures. Has, has the, you know, team members who, who's conducting the audit work, have they complied with all these standards and policies? That's basically something that we review, isn't it? And what else? Appropriate consultations have taken place. So if there is a, a significant matter that have arise during the audit process and the audit team members are not experienced enough to understand a solution for that particular situation, then what would they do? They could, you know, consult with either another uh, audit team member or more experienced audit team members within the firm itself, or they can, uh, you know, hire an external consultation firm as well, isn't it? If they do hire an external consultation firm, then the uh, process will be documented or uh, how they address that situation will be documented as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And uh, what else? The work performed supports the conclusions reached. So, do we have enough evidence or sufficient and appropriate evidence to back our conclusion? That's basically something that we ensure through a review, of course. And the evidence obtained is sufficient and appropriate to support the, to support the auditor's report as well. Kind of a sim uh, similar point. And what else? The objectives of the engagement procedures have been achieved. So whenever we conduct an audit procedure, a substantive procedure, for example, there is an objective to it, isn't it? It could be to satisfy an assertion, or it could be to obtain an understanding of something. It could be to confirm, verify, or ensure something, isn't it? So are these objectives, or have these objectives been met when conducting the procedures? Because if it's not, then there's, there's not necessarily any point in doing a particular procedure, isn't it? It would just be a waste of work if there is no objective to it, isn't it? So that's basically what we're ensuring here. Through a review, we're understanding as to whether we have done the appropriate level of work and was there a meaning to the work that we did or, or whatever was the objective of conducting that work? Has that objective been met? That's basically what we're ensuring here. And what else? The engagement partner must review audit documentation at appropriate points during the engagement, including documentation of significant matters, significant judgments, and other matters relevant to the engagement partner's responsibility. So folks, if there are any sort of, you know, significant matters that have arised while conducting the audit, for example, we've identified a risky area when conducting the audit, or there was a lot of non-compliance with accounting standards or things like that. So if there was such situations occurring, then what, what, what was the decisions that were made? And how did we resolve it? And have we documented everything that's done? That's basically what the engagement partner is ensuring here. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And yeah, it, 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 it's more relevant when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, the matters that should be included within the auditor's report as well, such as the emphasis on matter paragraphs or items to be included in the key audit matters as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind and what else? <clears throat> Moving on to another uh, aspect of review, that is engagement quality review or EQR. And which standard? specifies the aspects in relation to EQR, ISQM2. Okay, folks, remember that. 
and there is no ISQC standards now as you uh, as we discussed earlier this has been changed as well and so what is an engagement quality review exactly well if we take a look at an audit firm as you can see here we have an audit junior who conducts the work or conducts the preparation work I would say isn't it and then there would be the audit senior who reviews the work as well okay folks the audit senior reviews the work of audit juniors and the audit managers reviews the work of audit senior and then the audit partner reviews the work of the audit managers seniors as well as the entire team okay folks that's basically how the review process works within an audit team isn't it now who's going to review the work of audit partner or how can we make sure that uh, the audit partner has done everything appropriately and he has devoted the appropriate level of time and he has looked through all the relevant work papers which he has to etc who's going to make sure that happens that is why we conduct an eqr okay folks so if you think about it eqr is like a preventive measure to make sure that the audit team members have done the work appropriately and they have done the sufficient level of work that needs to be done to provide an appropriate opinion okay folks so that's basically the idea here and of course uh, as you may have guessed conducting eqr can contribute to the you know cost related aspects of conducting the overall audit which is why we usually conduct eqr for uh, listed clients as well as high risk clients as well okay folks remember that <clears throat> so the overall uh, work conducted by the audit team is reviewed by the EQR and who is this EQR exactly EQR can either be another audit partner or it can also be another uh, set of auditors from another external organization as well okay folks so remember that at, at, for organization I mean audit firms okay folks so remember that <clears throat> now moving on an engagement quality review is an objective evaluation of the significant judgments made by the engagement team and the conclusions reached thereon performed by the engagement quality reviewer and completed on or before the date of engagement report so when do we conduct the engagement quality review we conduct this either on or before the engagement report date okay folks remember that now moving on an engagement quality reviewer is a partner, other individual in the firm or an external individual appointed by the firm to perform the engagement quality review. So if we are dealing with like a, a big, uh, let's say a huge client, okay folks, a huge, let's say listed entity, then definitely we do conduct an EQR. Okay folks, and who is the person who conducts this EQR? It could be an audit partner and of course his team members as well and uh, it could be another individual either within the firm or external to the audit firm as well okay folks and of course this person who is external to the audit firm should have the sufficient level of like qualification as well as experience to conduct this as well isn't it so that, that's yet again another point to remember as well okay folks so keep this in mind so that's basically all about uh, eqr now moving on to more uh, relevant points as well Listed entities and other high-risk clients should be subject to an engagement quality review. Well, that seems kind of obvious, isn't it? And what else? High-risk clients include those which are in the public interest, those with unusual circumstances and risks, and, th uh, and those where laws or regulations require an EQR. So for some, uh, let's say, organizations, listed entities or uh, it depends upon the local laws and regulations as well so for some organizations mandatory to conduct or do uh, it could it could be as part of the local audit standards okay folks so sometimes the local audit standards will compel you to conduct an eqr as well okay folks that's basically the situation that has been uh, highlighted here and uh, and this is basically as part of isqm1 firm level uh, you know quality uh, management and what else for audit engagements where an EQR is required, the engagement partner must determine that an EQR has been appointed. Okay, so that's yet again the responsibility of the engagement partner, isn't it? So if you look, look closely, the first paragraph is basically a statement that is relevant to the firm as a whole, isn't it? That's basically why it is basically stated in ISQM1. Whereas in the second set of paragraph, we are... Uh, 
we are pointing out the responsibilities of the engagement partner here, isn't it? So we're looking at, at it from an individual level. Okay, folks, that is basically ISA 220 revised, of course. Now, uh, moving on. So what are the responsibilities of engagement partners uh, regarding EQR? He has to make sure that an EQR has been appointed and then uh, he should cooperate with the reviewer and inform other team members of their responsibility to do so. Okay, that seems kind of uh, obvious, isn't it? And what else? Discuss significant matters and significant judgments arising during the engagement with the reviewer. If we have uh, faced some sort of, you know, uh, an issue while conducting, while progressing through the audit, then this particular matter should be discussed with the reviewer. And we should also tell him how we resolve that issue as well. Okay, folks? And that's that's like one of the, uh, like, uh, the EQR does have the right to know that, isn't it? And it is his responsibility to understand as to whether uh, this particular resolution that we did was appropriate or not, isn't it? So that's basically the uh, idea here and what else? Not date the auditor's report until the completion of EQR. Okay, folks, so we, sh we should not uh, issue the audit report, uh, you know, before conducting the EQR. That's basically the idea here. And what else? <clears throat> So yeah, that's basically all about that and what else? So eligibility of an EQR, let's understand that. So who can be uh, an engagement quality reviewer? Obviously, if you can, you know, before deep diving into this, we could understand to a certain extent that it should be uh, someone of a, of a senior designation, that's definitely possible. And he should have years of experience and industry knowledge in relation to that client as well, isn't it? So there are some basic things that we can think out just like that as well. But what does this standard say? What does ISQM2 say about that? Let's take a look. It cannot be a member of the engagement team. I mean, that, that would basically be self-review, isn't it? So that's basically something that needs to be avoided. It should be someone who is external to the team. Okay, folks, it could be someone within the firm itself, within the audit firm itself, but it should not be uh, a team member who is aligned to audit that particular client. Okay, folks, remember that. And what else? Must have the competence and capabilities, including sufficient time and the appropriate authority to perform the EQR. Okay, folks, so yeah, the, that particular person who has been appointed as the EQR should devote sufficient amount of time to do the job. Okay, folks, so that's basically one aspect to it. And secondly, it should have the appropriate authority, which means that there should be a, an appropriate level. It should be an appropriate level of designation, like a partner or so. That's basically it. And what else? Must comply with relevant ethical requirements and laws and regulations. Of course, uh, you know, there should not be or the person who is conducting the uh, review, the EQR, should not uh, have an, there should not be any sort of like self-interest threat or this particular person should not be too familiar with the client or there should not be any uh, let's say intimidation threat or anything like that okay there should not be any sort of ethical threats uh, uh, between the EQR as well as the client and of course he should comply with all the laws and regulations that are stated for uh, the EQR as well okay folks remember that <clears throat> so that's basically just the eligibility of being an engagement quality reviewer and what else an engagement partner must serve as a cooling off, sorry, must serve a cooling off period of two years or longer if required by relevant ethical requirements before they can assume the role of EQR for the same client. So what's the idea here? So let's say that I have acted as an audit partner for a particular client for, for a lot of period of time, let's say uh, three or four years. And of course, uh, you know, Maybe after, let's say, seven years, there would be a familiarity threat, isn't it? And usually when, it, when a familiarity threat arises, we can have a cool off period of two years, isn't it? So just like that, even to conduct the, uh, you know, EQR, we kind of have a similar uh, rule of having a cool off period of two years. That's basically uh, all there is to it. Now, and of course, uh, I want you to consider the situation that is mentioned here as well. So. If you are conducting, let's say, an audit of, let's say, uh, sorry, you are acting as an audit partner for a particular client for a number of years, then in order for you to become an EQR for that client, there should be a full of period of two years. Okay, folks, or you can only become an EQR of that client after two years. That's basically it. That's a common rule stated by ISQM, and it could come in handy in the exam uh, if you are required to point out uh, some issues in relation to this as well. Okay, folks, remember that. What else? So folks, 
I'd like to take a moment to give a huge shout out to Fintram's Revision Bootcamp as well as the Memory Chart Book for various objects of ACCA that has proven to be a huge game changer for students for their revision purposes in the past few exam settings. So definitely check that out. Now, let's move on to the session, shall we? Uh, yeah, so that's all for the engagement performance aspect. Now let's talk about monitoring and remediation. Okay, so what's the big idea here? Let's take a look. So when we talk about monitoring and remediation, there are quite a few things that you should keep in mind. First of all, we talk about monitoring, we talk about evaluating deficiencies, we talk about remediating some issues as well as annual review as well. So what are these? Let's take a look at it one by one. A monitoring and remediation process must be established to provide relevant, reliable and timely information about the design, implementation and operation of the system of quality management and take appropriate actions to respond to identified deficiencies such as such that deficiencies are remediated on a timely basis. So folks, the basic idea behind remediation is that you have some policies and procedures or systems of controls within the organization or within the audit firm itself, isn't it? Not the audit client, we're focusing on the audit firm here, okay folks? So within the audit firm, we have some uh, like quality control measures implemented, isn't it? And monitoring is all about monitoring this particular process. Okay, folks, we're, we're taking a look at the quality measures that we have within the audit firm on, let's say, a timely basis. And if we have identified any sort of deficiencies within this particular process, then what do we do? Then we, uh, you know, take remedi remediation action. That's basically the uh, idea here. Okay, that's basically as to what this process is all about. Now, and remember guys, we're not talking about the internal control review or anything like that within the audit client. We're talking about the policies and controls that we have within the audit firm. Now, what else? In order to achieve this, the firm must do the following things. Establish quality objectives. There should be some quality objective set and we identify and assess the quality risk. Are there any sort of risks within the uh, firm existingly? Do we have, uh, are all the, let's say, human resources, that is the audit team members, are they all trained appropriately? And uh, are they all complying with the, let's say, the training procedures that we have within the audit firm, etc.? Things like that. Okay, folks, and what else? Uh, design and implement responses to address the quality risk. So let's say that we have identified uh, that, yeah, our objective, let's say that our uh, quality objective is that we conduct an annual, let's say, training session for auditors on the topic of independence, let's say. And uh, a quality, we've identified a quality risk that one of the, let's say, audit managers have not complied with the uh, particular, uh, let's say, independence aspect and there was, a, let's say, an ethical threat. Now, if we have identified such an issue, then what do we do? We obviously take corrective action, isn't it? We provide more training to the audit uh, manager. We uh, align that manager to another client, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So, we're just making sure that the quality uh, measures that we have within the audit firms are operating effectively or not, as simple as that. Moving on, the firm must monitor the system as a whole by inspecting completed engagements selected according to risk and taking consideration of other monitoring activities performed by the firm. So what's the idea here, guys? So it's kind of like a, a, a monitoring measure that we take. Okay, folks, so what we do is we all we take a look at some of the completed engagements. Okay, folks, some of the engagements that's closed and we have issued the audit report. So this is kind of similar to what we would call the cold review. Okay, folks, what is a cold review? Basically, we conduct an, a review of that of the particular audit work after issuing the uh, auditor's report, isn't it? Or after completing it. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So we're taking a, we're conducting a cold review to make sure that we have, uh, let's say, complied with all the professional standards and we have done the appropriate level of work. There are no quality control issues, exactly. That's basically it. And what else? Evaluate the severity of deficiencies and investigate the root cause of the deficiencies, evaluating the effect of quality management on the quality management system. <clears throat> so 
What's the big idea here? When conducting that particular review of the completed engagements, if we have identified any sort of deficiencies, then what do we do? Then, of course, the audit is already done, so there's nothing much to do about it. Unless it's too much of a serious issue, then definitely we will look at procedures to recall that particular report or so, if possible. But uh, over and above that, our focus is on the deficiencies. If we have any sort of mistakes, what do, what do we do? We learn from that mistakes, isn't it? That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, we identify the deficiencies and we identify, uh, you know, methods to prevent that deficiencies from happening in the future. As simple as that. And what else? Appropriately remediate deficiencies responsive to the root cause. So we identify the root cause of that deficiencies and what do we do? We take remediate uh, or corrective action. Okay, folks, that's basically all it is. <clears throat> and what else? Annual evaluation is required to be undertaken. So we, we can do this on an annual basis. That's basically uh, all there is to it. Okay, we, ha we have a set of controls and on an annual basis, we review those controls within the uh, audit firm just to make sure that everything is uh, happening appropriately and there are no, no uh, deficiencies happening. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. Now, moving on. So that reminds us of, you know, pre-issuance as well as post-issuance review or in other words hot and cold reviews isn't it so what are these and what are the differences let's quickly take a look at that appropriately and we have not missed out on anything and we have not uh you know uh we have not lacked quality anywhere that's basically all it is okay folks and what about cold review cold review is basically conducted as part of the monitoring process which we just looked at isn't it so what do we do here we take a look at our one of the you know completed engagements and take a look at as to whether there were any deficiencies or not okay folks if there were any sort of deficiencies or we uh, we we find the root cause of those deficiencies and take preventive measures to make sure that we don't make the same mistake again okay folks that's basically all it is to identify any deficiencies in the firm's processes as simple as that and when do we conduct these that's kind of an easy point isn't it so we conduct the whole review before the audit report is issued and we conduct the post issuance review after the audit re report has been issued as simple as that and what else so on what do we conduct these reviews anyway well when it comes to the whole reviews we conduct whole reviews on listed clients that seems kind of obvious, isn't it? And of course, public interest engagements as well. We conduct this on engagements where there are particular risks as well. Okay, but this is basically, you know, the high risk audit clients. That's basically all it is. And then we have in each partner should have some of their engagements review. So uh, this is this is just a principle that some audit firms have. So uh, or it should have in a way, isn't it? So for each of the audit firms, there would be a number of partners within them, isn't it? It could be two, three, four, or even, uh, you know, more than 50 or even 100, okay, folks, depending upon the size of the audit firm itself. So each for each partners or, the, or for the clients aligned to each of these partners, a whole review should be conducted in at least some of them. Okay, folks, that's basically the principle here. Uh, and what about post issuance review or on which clients do we conduct the uh, post issuance review or cold review? Well, it's basically a selection of completed engagements. That's basically all it is. Okay, folks. So sometimes we can, you know, take a look at some of the work conducted on a listed client or any other. It could be an unlisted client as well. So even a small client as well depends upon, uh, you know, where we have to look for to identify a deficiency. That's basically it. Depends. It depends upon each of the uh, audit firms itself. So yeah. Moving on. <clears throat> Who is it conducted by? Let's take a look at that. A hot review is conducted by an independent partner of suitable experience and authority. Kind of a similar, uh, I would say, qualification that of that of an EQR, isn't it? So that's basically all it is. It's a, it's a separate independent partner. And what else? And since it's a quality measure, we don't we don't hire like external, uh, you know, audit firms or audit team members to conduct the uh, per this particular hot review. Okay, folks, for EQR, yes, we do that, but for hot reviews. We're just gonna you know ask another audit partner of the firm to do this that's basically all there is to it and yeah that particular person should be independent of the audit team now what else a dedicated compliance or quality department so for a cold review uh, who conducts the particular review well a dedicated compliance or quality department or a qualified external consultant or an independent partner 
See, folks, it could be anyone because it's already a closed case. We're just trying to identify where we went wrong, isn't it? That's basically all there is to it. So it can be conducted. So if the audit firm has, let's say, a quality department, which ensures that, you know, uh, our quality is not lacking, then we use that department to conduct this. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Or it could be an independent partner or even an external consultant as well. Okay, folks, it does. Now, moving on. So what is considered when we conduct this review? Well, for HUD reviews, the processes underpin underpinning judgments made, okay, folks? So have we made the right call on our judgments? Okay, folks, have we, have we made the right, uh, you know, uh, conclusions? And on what basis have we made those conclusions? And are those bases correct? That's basically what we are uh, trying to underpin here. Or that, that's basically what we're looking for uh, in a HUD review. And what about cold review? We review all the working papers on an audit client to make sure that you know everything has been done appropriately. That's basically all it is. And uh, so specifically, what kind of judgments do are we talking about here? Let's take a look. Uh, for uh, for the case of a hard review, we look at significant risk and responses to them. We look at matters requiring consultation. We look at materiality, independence, conclusion, misstatements, the audit opinion, matters to be communicated to management and those charged with governance as well. Okay, folks, these are the areas that we focus on on a hot review. What about on a cold review? Well, uh, to ensure that all working papers, so of course we review all the working papers, isn't it? To make sure that everything uh, you know has been done appropriately. So we take a look at, uh, we make sure that all these, you know, documentations are on file and they are complete. There are no open items and, uh, you know, are they signed off as complete by, let's say, the preparer or the reviewer? And then uh, are they evidenced as reviewed? Ha have they been reviewed by the appropriate person, a senior or manager, etc.? And what else? The work undertaken is sufficient and has been documented appropriately. So these are the things that we make sure in a cold review. Now, what else? So what are the outcomes of hot reviews and cold review? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Let's take a look. So the outcome of a hot review is a reduction in audit risk. That is the risk that the auditor expresses an inappropriate audit opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated. So there is a decreased level of detection risk. Isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And what about for a cold review? Let's take a look at that. Identify remedial action that should be taken. So what's done is done, isn't it? So we have closed that engagement already. So what we can make sure is that we don't repeat the same mistake again in the future. Okay, folks, that's basically it. So we take remedial actions such as as a control measures within our organization to make sure that such deficiencies do not happen again. Okay, folks. So recommendations will be uh, made including the communication of findings, additional quality reviews. We provide training to our team members, uh, changes to the firm's policies and procedures if necessary, and of course, disciplinary action if that se that seems necessary as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. <clears throat> so that's basically all about the monitoring and remediation aspect. Okay, folks, and the difference between you know hot and cold reviews. Now, moving on to another element of uh, quality management systems, that is overall responsibility. Okay, so that seems kind of obvious, isn't it? So who has the overall responsibility uh, of an audit engagement? Definitely the audit partner itself. And we've already looked at that when we talk about leader leadership responsibility element as well, isn't it? So remember that. And what else? Prior to dating the auditor's report, the engagement partner must ensure their involvement has been sufficient and appropriate throughout the audit engagement, such that they have a basis for determining that the engage that that the significant judgments made and the conclusions reached are appropriate. So what's the idea here, guys? The engagement partner is the overall responsible person, isn't it? So so this particular individual, he should make sure that he devotes the appropriate level of time and he should make sure that the evidence obtained and the conclusions reached are appropriate as well. That's a simple thing, isn't it? And what else? Indicators that the engagement partner may not have had sufficient involvement with the engagement include lack of timely review by the engagement partner and a lack of evidence of the engagement partner's direction and supervision. So what's the idea here? So we are basically making sure that, uh, you know, as we stated earlier, uh, 
we should make sure or the engagement partner is responsible for devoting the substantial amount of time and you know taking a look at the conclusions etc so what would be a lack of responsibility from the part of our you know the engagement partner just the opposite isn't it so that's basically uh you know the engagement partner may not have devoted sufficient level of time or uh what else yeah he may not have conducted the review appropriately or he may not have you know reviewed the work appropriately and he may have missed out on let's say significant issues etc okay folks so these are some of the defaults that could be made by the audit partner himself okay folks so that's basically the idea here so that it's just a simple point that's basically all it is so who is the overall person responsible here the engagement partner as simple as that now so moving on to the last element that is documentation so what is documentation all about as auditors we document everything isn't it so we're just making sure as part of you know the quality management system we're making sure that everything has been documented appropriately and their own file they are signed off appropriately etc okay folks so let's take a look isc 220 revised requires auditors to document conclusions reached with respect to fulfillment of responsibilities relating to ethical requirements and acceptance and continuance yes that seems kind of obvious isn't it of course we have to uh, you know uh, the conclusions reached have we you know reached appropriate conclusions or uh, did we reach did we get there by complying with all the you know professional standards or ethical requirements as well as uh, you know uh, have we accepted that particular engagement by considering all the factors uh, in uh, in isa 210 such as preconditions of the audit as well as uh were there any sort of other uh let's say uh you know important aspect that we missed out on etc that's basically what we look at and what else uh the nature scope and conclusions resulting from consultations undertaken during the course of the audit so if we have you know made some sort of consultations then we document that as well and what else if the audit engagement is subject to an eqr that the EQR has been completed on or before the engage, sorry, the date of the auditor's report. So, if we have conducted an EQR, do we have sufficient documentation there as well? That's basically all that is. Okay, it's all about uh, you know documenting everything that has been conducted here, be it consultation, be it EQR, and be it the conclusions reached as well as the compliance of the team members regarding professional standards or ethical requirements etc okay folks that's basically it and of course we also uh, you know document aspects in relation to independence of uh, each of our team members as well isn't it so that's basically the idea here okay folks now so that's basically all about the uh, you know elements and there are a few more points regarding documentation as well let's take a look during completion of the audit the engagement quality reviewer has to document yet again the following things so what all things should the EQR document when completing the audit? That's basically something that's stated in ISQM2 as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at as what these are. The name of the engagement quality control reviewer. Well, that seems kind of obvious, isn't it? And what else? And individuals who assisted with the review. So, folks, the EQR is not just conducted by one individual. Okay, folks, it can also be conducted by a team, depending upon the you know size of the work that needs to be done. So there would be another like let's say audit team or the quality reviewers who who would be reviewing the work of a audit team who is who has conducted the work of that particular audit client okay folks so that's basically the case so we uh, mentioned the name of the engagement quality uh, reviewer which is basically the partner who conducted that particular thing as well as the team members who has assisted him as well and what else the engagement documentation reviewed so what all things have we reviewed we document those the basis for the conclusion on whether the requirements of ISQM2 have been fulfilled and whether the EQR is complete. If it is complete, we document that as well. Okay, folks, we document everything, isn't it? So that's basically the uh, simple case here. That the engagement partner <clears throat> has been notified of any concern about significant judgments made about the engagement team and the EQR is complete and the date of completion of EQR. So yeah, we document the date of completion. When have we completed the EQR as well as if there were any sort of significant or risky areas that were that were discussed or that were faced by the audit team members. And uh, it should be discussed with the EQR and the method of how they address these issues using their judgment is also discussed with EQR as well, isn't it? So all these discussions are documented. 
as simple as that. Okay, folks. So that's basically all about the documentation aspect. And that is basically all about the elements of quality control as well. Okay, folks. So basically, it's all a mix of like three standards. That's basically all it is. There is IS ISA 220 revised and then ISQM1 as well as ISQM2 as well. Okay, folks. So that's basically all about quality control. And of course, we will also be looking at some you know, questions regarding sustainability and information and KPIs, etc. within the video question maps. And we'll be practicing a, quite a, a few questions there to understand how to, you know, demonstrate or how to present the answer in such situations as well. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. So that's basically all the changes that are made to the advanced audit and assurance paper, which is effective from uh, September 2020. And that's all that I wanted to cover in this particular session as well. Okay, folks, so I will see you later in the next session where we will be discussing some more interesting aspects. So, okay, folks, so till then, this is Vishnu Vijay signing off.